Amen. As I was reading some verses here in Mark chapter 8, I could not help but think about uh, what I would title, I guess, a message. Uh, it would be the normal Christian life, uh, following and serving the King. I believe that would be a, a, a good... And you understand that. You said the normal Christian life. Yes, the normal Christian life, following and serving the King. Now, the normal Christian life involves dying to self that we may find life in Christ. So we're going to have to die to self in order to find life in Christ. I was reading a book uh, a couple years ago, and this kind of brought back some perspective, if you will, about this particular portion of Scripture. The book was by a man by the name of David Platt in his book called Radical. I highly recommend the book. It's a very, uh, it's a very um, uh, convicting book. But he said this, and I want you to listen to this statement because it sums up today in 2019 where we are in American Christianity. We American Christians have a way of taking the Jesus of the Bible and twisting Him into a version of Jesus that we are more comfortable with. A nice middle class American Jesus... A Jesus who doesn't mind materialism or who would never call us to give away everything we have. A Jesus who is fine with nominal devotion that does not infringe on our comforts. A Jesus who wants to be balanced, who wants us to avoid dangerous extremes, and who, for that matter, wants, to, uh, wants us to avoid danger altogether. A Jesus who brings comfort and prosperity to us as we live out our Christian spin on the American dream. Any fair and honest reading of Scripture will reveal that this is not the Jesus of the Bible. Especially when we're reading in Mark chapter 8, this text here will provide uh, us some, some questions, really three crucial questions that we'll have to answer before we leave today. The first question is this, who is Jesus? The second question is, what did He come to do? And the third and final question is, what does He expect of you and me? I believe this is the beginning of the great discipleship discourse in Mark chapter 8. I believe we see Jesus, of course, He predicting His, uh, His death, His burial and resurrection, and immediately following each time in Mark chapter 10, and uh, uh, in Mark chapter 8, and Mark chapter 9, we see different occasions. Uh, but He uh, immediately following each of these discourses, you think, uh, see Jesus predicting or prophesying His uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, there's a few things that I want to give you very, uh, very briefly, but you, you need to listen. And if you have a pen, you can write some of these things down on the flyleaf of your Bible or on a piece of paper, because I want you to know these things. The first thing, in order to be in what we would call the normal Christian life. Now, you say, preacher, that, that's kind of a, a strange thing. Well, we're getting somewhere, but normal Christian life, serving and following Jesus, the first thing you must come to is you must know and personally confess who Jesus is. You must know and personally confess who Jesus is. Now let's go back, Mark chapter 8 and verse number 27. Let's reread that. The Bible says, And Jesus went out and His disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, He asked His disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am. Now notice, he didn't ask the disciples who they thought Jesus was. We're getting there. He said, who does other men say that I am? Who, what, what's, the, what's the consensus across the board? Who does these men that you hear out in the streets, who do they say that I am? Look at verse 28. And they answered, John the Baptist. Well, who said that? It was Herod Antipas. If you remember in Mark chapter 6, Remember Herod Antipas who said, I believe that's John the Baptist resurrected? He was scared to death because he had done put him to death. He thought that John the Baptist had come from the dead. So Herod Antipas thought that, and I'm sure there was a few others that thought this was the reincarnation of John the Baptist. Others said, look at verse 28, and some say Elias or Elijah. Hey, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, there's some out there that just says you're, you're Elijah of the Old Testament. But then, 
Some said that he was a prophet. Look at verse 29, and they saith unto him, But whom say ye that I am? So Jesus looks at these twelve, and he says, so, so, so that's what they say, but what do you say? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. I think that's, that's, that's intriguing to me because if you notice that if we must know and personally confess Jesus is, Jesus took these 12 disciples all the way up north. So there's a big journey uh, from the Sea of Galilee to Caesarea Philippi. I stood exactly where uh, in Caesarea Philippi. I got to see the uh, palace of Herod Antipas, the one who thought that Jesus was John the Baptist. I saw that the ruins of that palace. I stood there in the temple of Pan, uh, a very idolatry-driven uh, uh, city, uh, a paganistic city, uh, a vile city. And it's interesting to me that Jesus took them to this city and set the twelve down in the middle of this vile, corrupt city and asked them these questions. Who do they say that I am? Oh, uh, you're John the Baptist, you're Elijah, you're a prophet. Who do you say that I am? Peter stands up and says, well, you're, you're the Christ. Right there in the middle of this wicked city. It's an inescapable question because the disciples gave the popular opinion making the rounds. And if you see in Mark chapter 6, some agreed that Herod Antipas was right, that John the Baptist was resurrected. But then there's an, an acceptable answer because Peter stands up and says, Thou art the Christ. Now, I think all through the Gospel of Mark, and I'm getting somewhere, just stay with me, all through the Gospel of Mark, starting in chapter 1 and verse 1, we see that Mark actually declares, the narrator, that Jesus Christ, uh, according to verse number 1, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. Hey, we see the demons, they declared it. Hey, God the Father did in, in, in uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 11. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hey, the Father actually bra bragged on the Son and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hey, the demons, what did they say in chapter 1? They called Him the Holy One of God. They said, why are you troubling us, thou Son of God? Hey, they kept referring to Him in three or four different passages that Jesus Christ was, and uh, who He says He is, the Son of the living God. And can I tell you this morning that if you deny the deity of Christ, my friend, you cannot know for sure that you're going to heaven. The deity of Christ is essential. This man really is the Son of God. Hey, that, that's, that's a, a, captivating, a captivating moment in the life of these disciples. And at the center of Mark's Gospel, we see the voice of Peter. He's added that you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Now, popular and trendy views of Jesus must always surrender to what the Word of God says. I mean, people will commercialize Jesus. They'll put Him on a billboard. They'll put Him over here, Jesus. And that we've almost made Jesus cool in society. But my friend, if it doesn't line up with the Scripture, then it's not accurate. So the second thing we see is one must know and personally confess who Jesus is. Exactly what Peter did in verses 27 through verse number 30. And then in verse 30, though, he charged them that they should tell no man of Him. The second thing I want you to see, and we, see, we go down to verse 31. Notice what it says. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed after three days. I like this. But I, and after three days, rise again. Amen. I thank the Lord for that. Verse 32, And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to... What did Peter do? Rebuke him. So Peter had just testified to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and just a few verses down, now Peter is rebuking Jesus. Now notice verse 32. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of 
men. So here's the second thing we need to know. Not only affirm and, and, and openly declare who Jesus is, but the second thing, we must learn and affirm the ways of God and not man. We must learn and affirm the ways of God and not man. See, the first half of the Gospel of Mark deals with who Jesus is, but the second half of the Gospel of Mark deals on what Jesus came to do. And we know that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's very clear. But I want you to remind you that God's ways are often hard, but they're clear. They may be hard, but they are clear. Because verse 31 says, He began to teach them, now notice this, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days, rise again. It doesn't get much harder than that. But it doesn't get much clearer than that. And we see that He declares that He is, he is uh, uh, going to die on the cross, and that three days later He would rise. See, Jesus is the Christ, the Davidic Son of Psalms chapter 2. He is the Son of Man of Daniel chapter 7. He will usher in the eternal kingdom over which He will rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. However, God's way will be different than what the world expects. See, the world that exalts power would expect that He will suffer and be rejected, especially by the religious established, be killed, and then three days later rise again. All of this must happen. All of this has to happen in order for Jesus to die on the cross for the sins of the world. This is what the Scripture promised in the Old Testament. This is what Jesus came to do and to fulfill the law and to die on the cross to save the world from their sin. It had to happen this way. God's will though, the second thing I see, is God's will is often a challenge, but lotus, but perfect. God's will is often a challenge but perfect. Skip down with me in verse number 32. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. God's will is an often a challenge, but perfect. See, Peter was on board with Jesus being the Messiah. But he was not on board with Jesus going to the cross. Oh, thou art the Christ! Yeah, we saw what you did just a few verses ago when you took that bread and you took those small fishes and you break it and you fed 4,000. We were there. Jesus, that was cool. And we saw you a while ago when you touched that blind man and you healed him. We saw you when you scolded those Pharisees and you did that in love, but you did that with boldness and courage. Hey, you're the Christ. But then Jesus says, now listen, here's what's going to happen. They're going to hate me. And because you love me, they're going to hate you too. I must go to the cross and I must suffer many things. They're going, to, they're going to take spikes and they're going to drive them in my hands and they're going to take spikes and they're going to drive them in my feet. They're going to, they're going to rip my beard out. They're going to curse me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to strip me of my garments and they're actually going to cast lots for those at the bottom of the cross. They're going to laugh. They're going to make fun. They're going to say, hey, if you are the Christ, why don't you just command those angels to come down and get you off that? Hey, uh, if you are the Christ, won't you just get yourself off of the cross? They're going to make fun. Many will not believe. The reason that Peter was not on board with Jesus going to the cross is because I think there was some fear there that Peter said, you know what, if, I, if he goes to the cross, maybe we will too. If, if Jesus goes to the cross then, and we're a follower of Jesus and He's going to be beaten and suffer many things, then that means maybe we disciples are going to have to go through that. See, Peter wants a Jesus who fits his agenda. Church, can I say today, is that, is that really what you think of Jesus? Is, uh, I want a Jesus, though, a, a Jesus on Monday, Thursday, and, and, and Saturday, but, but, but you know, the other days they belong to me. 
I want a Sunday Jesus. Ooh. I want a Jesus where, you know, I can just kind of, oh, come to church and do my thing. Oh, I hate that. I'll do my thing. Let me just say that Jesus is not a thing. Neither is church, by the way. I'll do my thing. And then I'll just do whatever I want. See, that's the Jesus, the American Jesus. That's the, well, you know, we're just going to be real spiritual on Sunday, but the rest of the week, we'll just kind of do what we want to do. I believe there was a little bit of that in Peter, like there's a little bit of that in us. He thinks he knows the kind of Messiah Jesus needs to be and attempts to reshape and redefine Him to fit His conception. Are we not often guilty of doing the same thing? We're not often guilty. Give me Jesus I can control. Give me a Jesus that I can conjure up in my image and likeness. No, you and I must learn and affirm the ways of God and not man. See, it may not be easy, it may not be safe. It will, however, be best. In fact, it will be perfect. So, in order, and I knew, listen, we're getting somewhere. Stay with me. You must know and personally confess who Jesus is. Peter, hey Peter, uh, who, who do you say we are? Uh, who do you say I am, Peter? I, you are the Christ. Hey, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hey, uh, boy, we love you, Jesus. We've seen all the miracles you've done. Peter's up in Jesus' face saying, how in the world could you tell us that you're going to die on the cross? How in the, the, Jesus, that's the most crazy thing I've ever heard. That people's not going to love you. Have you not seen uh, the way people treat you when you show up around the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum? Do you not see how people are? They're, they, they're pressing up against you and they're thronging you that you, have, you actually have to push out of a boat to teach. And you're telling me that those people are going to be the ones that crucify you? Jesus, that's absurd. Can you see the argument? But can you see Jesus look at Peter and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Peter was actually letting Satan use him to try to step between him and the cross. Jesus knew where that was coming from. That was not coming totally from Peter. That was coming from Lucifer. So the third and final thing that I give you this morning is this. You must understand and accept that Jesus calls you to die. Now this is the meat of the message. He calls us not to live, to die. Notice in verse number 34, business picks up a little bit. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me and let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man? if he shall gain the world, the whole world, and lose his own soul. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. God's ways are often hard, but usually clear. See, there, there's a challenge uh, with living for God, and there's a challenge in following Christ, but there's, uh, it may be challenged, but it's always perfect. I want to notice this. There's just a couple things, and we'll be done, but I want you to perk your ears up just a little bit. There's some areas, really three areas, that we can, when we come, He calls us to die, these areas be a must. The self-centered life 
must be put to death. The self-centered life must be put to death. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, Jesus lays out the essence of the normal Christian life. The basics of discipleship, which sadly in our day looks like a radical Christian when someone's on fire for the Lord, when someone is sold out for God, when someone comes to church and they're here Sunday morning and Sunday evening and they're here Wednesday evening for Bible study, and we think that is a radical Christian. That's actually what a normal Christian should look like. We think someone's sold out when they go out and they evangelize and they share people the gospel and they tell people that Jesus loves them. Oh, he's a radical Christian. No, he's what Jesus was talking about right here. The self-centered life must be put to death. Being Jesus' disciples requires three essentials. Don't miss this. Three things in order to be a disciple of Christ. The first thing is this. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Give up the right to self determination. See, that goes contrary to what the world is teaching today. Hey, you've got it in you and believe in you. And, uh, it's, it's in you, down inside and the, the, the power of an empowerment itself. And you are somebody and you this. And, and all this powered stuff and you've got it within you you know what that's the opposite of what jesus teaches he says first deny yourself hey deny your own power give up the right of self-determination put to death the idol of i Put to death the idol of I. You know what? We live in a humanistic uh, age where everybody is being trained today from a small age to an adult that you are an idol. Everything has to be revolving around your aspirations. Everything has to revolve around your dreams. Oh, this ain't popular. I'd get more grunts in a Presbyterian church today preaching something. But, but I'm telling you this. Hey, the reason why some of you are looking at me like Kalaja, the wooden Indian, is because you have a problem with you. You have an eye problem. Well, I, can't, I just don't know if I can sell out totally. To God. Well, okay, Peter. All right. Told you it wasn't going to be real happy. Deny yourself. Put to death the idol of I. Say no to you and say yes to Jesus. See, the second thing we need to do in order to be a disciple, not only deny ourself, but take up your cross. Die. Take up your cross. What's Luke 9.23 say? It says, it adds the word, same wording, same story, same Jesus. Well, here's what he says. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Here's the difference. Daily. Now Mark left out daily. So I like Luke's version. Daily. Daily. Well, preacher, I don't know if I could read my Bible every day, and I don't know if I could be a Christian every day. Well, according to Luke chapter 9, you can. Or at least we should. It's necessary to be Christ's disciple. It is a slow and painful death. Do you realize where all of these men outside of Jews Iscariot and John on the Isle of Patmos who was exiled, boiled alive, and exiled to the Isle of Patmos, do you realize where the rest of the disciples ended up? martyred. Peter, the one who stood before Christ and said, uh, uh, how dare you say that? You're the Christ. Uh, they're not going to crucify you. Yeah, Peter, later in his ministry, God used him greatly. You know where Peter was? They said, because of you being a follower of Christ, not many years after, they found Peter and they crucified Peter upside down. And the reason they crucified Peter upside down is because Peter would not let them crucify him like Christ. He said, I'm not worthy, so hang me upside down. The rest of the disciples, Thomas, Bartholomew, 
Many of them were beheaded, drugged through the streets, crucified. John, he was tortured, boiled alive, exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Oh, he, he, this is not normal. Hey, it's not natural, but it's necessary to be Christ's disciple. And it is a slow and painful death. You say, well, preacher, I'd love to be this. I have decided to follow Jesus. Have you? Because if you have, it'll cost you something. Finally, the third thing that it, the third thing that it requires to be a, a disciple he says, follow me. Follow me. See, are we willing to believe that and obey Jesus? It, it will be radical. No, nonetheless, it will be radical, but not comfortable because it involves a death to the self-centered life. You're going to have to die to your dreams and your wants and your desires in order to follow what Jesus wants. So, the self-centered life must be put to death. It must be. The second thing is this. The safe life must be put to death. Notice what he says in verse 35. He says, For whosoever shall or will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the Gospels, the same shall save it. See, if you save or treasure your life above all else, you'll lose it. The one who plays it safe and considers his existence to uh, more than uh, important than Jesus will lose both Jesus and eternal life. I believe that. But in contrast, the one who gives his life for Jesus and the gospel will actually save his life. Following Jesus, it involves risking it all. It involves risking your safety, risking your security, risking your satisfaction in this world. But He promises us that He will lead us to a great reward. The world can never offer that. There is a life worth living and giving for the glory of God and the Gospel. There is a life. J.I. Packer, a great commentator and preacher, says this, there are, in fact, two motives that should spur us constantly to evangelize. The first is love to God and concern for His glory. The second is to love man and be concerned for His welfare. What a statement. You're concerned for God's glory. You're also concerned for man's welfare. That's a disciple. C.T. Studd, a missionary to China and India and Sudan, he said this, We will dare to trust our God and we will do it with His joy unspeakable, singing aloud in our hearts, and we will a thousand times sooner die trusting only in our God than live trusting in man. Some of you get very nervous when the stock market ain't doing well. You get very nervous when things seem to be unraveling in your life because you're looking in things, but you're looking in the wrong places. When someone steps out of their comfort zone a little bit and says, hey, we want you to step out of your comfort zone and step out and follow Christ, everybody kind of, oh, we, I don't know, that's a little radical. But that, no, that's not according to what Jesus is teaching here. So the safe life must be put to death. But how about this? The self-serving life must be put to death. The self-serving life, the safe life, the self-centered life must be put to death. You know what Jesus, look, look back at what Jesus is asking here. He said, for what shall it, in verse 36, for what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know what the answer to both of those questions were? Nothing. Nothing. Are y'all getting this this morning? Well, what are you going to do if you gain the whole world but you lose your soul? Hey, what would it profit you if you had all these earthly possessions but you never were a follower of Christ? Nothing. 
You'll stand before God one day and all the money that you earned on this earth and all the possessions that you had and you said, well, preacher, I worked hard. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. But can I tell you, you'll not take one dime of it with you to heaven. Well, I've got this in an IRA and I've got this in a CD and I've got this in investments and I made some money over here and I've got this and I do this and hey, all that sounds great. Hey, as long as you tithe and give to missions, I don't care. But can I tell you this? One day, you'll stand before God and He'll say, did you leave all to follow me? April 17th, 1998, this is in Newsweek magazine, a woman by the name of Linda McCartney, wife of Paul McCartney of the Beatles, died. The Newsweek article in 1998 put this out. The McCartneys had all the money in the world. Enough to afford their privacy. Enough to afford and give them a beautiful view. But all the money in the world wasn't enough to keep her alive. I like what John Piper says. Listen to this. What's the opposite? He was referring to verse 38 about our Lord being ashamed of us if we're ashamed of Him. What's the opposite of being ashamed of someone? Being proud of them. Admiring them. Not being embarrassed to be seen with them. Loving to be identified with them. So Jesus is saying, uh, if you are embarrassed by me and the price I paid for you, and He's not referring to the lapse of courage when you don't share your face, but a settled state of your heart toward Him. If you're not proud of me and you don't cherish the what I did for you, if you want to put yourself with the goats and their value and their reputation in the goat herd more than you value me, then that's the way I will view you when I come. I will be ashamed of you, and you will perish with the people who consider me an embarrassment. Surely, there is no one sitting in this room today that is embarrassed of Christ. Surely. In my weak times, there's been times where I've denied Christ. Yes, I remember one time, this is years ago, I was in an elevator uh, out of town somewhere, and, 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 and I remember a lady stepped on the elevator. And I was at a hospital, I believe it was, on an elevator, actually going to go visit somebody. I was in my early 20s, really not knowing for sure what God would have me do the rest of my life. This lady looks at me and says, uh, Sir, what do you do for a living? And instead of telling her that I was a preacher of the gospel or I was a pastor or anything like that, and at that time I was not, I was, I was a preacher, but I wasn't a pastor, I came up with something else. And as soon as she got off on the elevator, the Holy Spirit of God smote me in my heart and said, What did you just do? What did you just do? You had the perfect opportunity to tell her what you were and do. Hey, you say, Pastor, you're admitting? Oh, absolutely. Could we not all say at times where we've been weak and embarrassed? Where someone has cursed around you or taken God's name in vain and instead of blushing about it and standing firm in your belief and saying, hey, no, I don't, I don't participate in that. We go along with it because of our... Oh, we'll give Peter a hard time. Oh, around the fire, he denied the Lord three times. How dare Peter do... Oh, how about us? Dietrich Bonhoeffer great one who wrote a wonderful book, a classic. He was in the concentration camps and imprisonment in, in Germany, a, a German pastor. He understood what the normal Christian life should look like. The way may have been hard for him, the path. He was, of course, persecuted. Here's what Bonhoeffer said. 
He said, the cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of the encounter with Christ. As we embark upon the discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with His death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life. But it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, He bids him to come and die. But it is the same death every time. Death in Jesus Christ. The death of the old man at his call. Jesus summons to the rich young man was calling him to die because only the man who is dead to his own will can follow Christ. In fact, every command of Jesus is a call to die. With all our affection and lust... But we do not want to die, and therefore Jesus Christ and His call are necessarily our death as well as our life. The call to discipleship, the baptism in the name of Jesus, means both death and life. Hey, has there been a funeral in your life where you've died? Luke says that we should die daily. Pick up our cross daily. There ought to be a cross, a suffering. Now there will be some people in here today not understand one thing I preached. You'll not understand about being a disciple because how can you when you don't know Jesus? There will be others, You and I'm not getting on to you, but Sunday morning, hey, I'm just going to do my thing. And I hope it makes you mad enough to come back Sunday evening. I'm doing my thing, man. I'm just getting Jesus out of the way Sunday morning so the rest of the week I can just do my thing. Well, pastor, that's not the way I am. Prove it. Well, I don't have to prove nothing to you. Prove it to God. May all of us learn to die for Christ. I don't die for Christ because I'm a preacher. I die because I'm a Christian. And that we and others may truly live. May all of us learn what is and how to live. Hey, Mark chapter 8, when I got this week and I knew what I would be preaching according to the text, the next verse, the next chapter, I knew that I would go to the most difficult passage, I believe, in the whole Gospel of Mark. It's difficult because it calls all of us to come and die. To surrender daily, to surrender to Christ, to be a disciple. Why do you think on on both sides of the wall here in our church, it says, follow me, become a disciple. Why? Because we don't just win people to Christ. What do we do? We teach them to die. To become a disciple. To tell others to die also. Why do you think that Bible Baptist Church in the last few years has grown, not just numerically, but spiritually. I'll tell you why. Some people had to die. Some people had to die. Some people had to die to self and say, you know what, this is not about me. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, let's reflect this evening. Let's reflect this morning. Let's reflect all day about the message. Am I a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's close our eyes and bow our heads this morning.